Casey, thank you so much for coming to the show. Of course. So you are a huge TikTok creator and you recently just migrated like your content onto like different platforms and then you are hosting your own LinkedIn show. I have to say one of the things that really shocked me the most is you have two completely different creator personalities in like real life as well as when you're online on TikTok. You are essentially like the most like funniest, entertaining person on TikTok and talking about, you're like essentially, well, similar to what I told you yesterday, you're like a Mickey Mouse, but in real life, you're like smart and sharp and then like talk business. So uh, to start the show, I would love to hear your story on like, you know, how you started and then how you got to where you are. I got into TikTok, so I never really made content before last year, I guess at this point, a year and a half ago. And I've always enjoyed video making. Back in the early 2000s, I remember I used to take piano lessons and my piano teacher had a couple of sons that were my age. So after I'd have piano lessons, we'd go and we make videos and mess around. This was when the iMac, I wanna say it was the G4 came out. So iMovie was brand new. So we just mess around with that for hours on end. And then when I was in middle school in the mid 2000s, some friends and I made YouTube videos, but after that, really didn't make any content, but I've always enjoyed storytelling. And I think it just got to the point, you know, right as the pandemic started to hit, I was running out of things to procrastinate with while I was in my last year of law school. So I figured I'd give TikTok a try and it sort of snowballed from there. And here we are. Yeah, totally. I think this is such a successful experience to, you know, kill your boredom as I also don't think like if I were in law school, I would probably be extremely busy with everything because it's you know law school so I'm like so surprised that you're like so productive so you can actually have time to make TikTok because being a creator or creating those short form content are essentially a real full-time job can you tell us more about like you know what is the behind the scene of your day-to-day -day of um, doing this mass produced like short internet series essentially you're like the what is everything guy, um, the, uh, the guy behind everything. How do you really come up with the series idea? And then how do you stumble upon your, you call it not a niche, but a niche? Yeah, so maybe first to address the sort of niche question. I always think it's interesting how, especially over the last year and a half, two years, the word niche gets thrown out a lot and it's thrown around. I never heard that before, but I was always just a fan. I was always a fan of either, whether it be watching TikToks, Vines, being on YouTube, Twitch, that's something, a term that I've never heard before until relatively recently. Mm -hmm. And I think while I do have a niche and I think having a niche is important to have, you know, and a focus on when you're making content, you never want to limit yourself to too narrow of a niche because it's always a trade-off, right? Mm -hmm. Even though the more specific your niche gets, potentially the more loyal your audience is going to be, you're also reaching much fewer people and you're intentionally doing that. And so for me, I've decided if we're going to call it a niche, it's going to be the education niche, but that's painting with a very, very broad brush. And the reason why I chose to go down that route and the reason why I make these very simple short form educational videos is, First of all, my demographic just happened to be in sort of spiral to the point where it is a Gen Z audience. Mm -hmm. And so it really works out making short form content because you don't want to make things too long or too complicated or too boring anyway. Mm -hmm. But one of the reasons why I enjoy doing sort of videos under the educational umbrella is, like I said, it's a very, very broad niche, if you even want to call it that. Mm -hmm. And the possibilities are pretty much endless. I'm, I'm the kind of person that is going to annoy you at a party. I will tell you a fun fact about the artist that's playing in the background. I'll tell you about the region where your glass of wine came from. I've always been that really annoying guy. So it just works out. I get to be the annoying guy, but for millions of people on the internet. Yeah, I love that. I feel like you're turning your, you know, real life passion into like an online property. So to talk about like, this is like, this is like a, like how to be a creator vibe talk. So I'm just curious, like when you are thinking about 
producing these videos by producing i mean maybe you're just making it in your bedroom and then like you know editing it like one video at a time curious like what is the actual production looks like do you go out there to pick you know 10 lists all the time or like do you uh, produce like you know one video at a time if this video react to like a lot of people react to it then you double down on you know like hitting the algorithm or like how do you really figure out what is like your today's agenda and then like how do you kind of like do you mass produce it or do you um, write a specific script I wish I could say I was that organized maybe one day in the future, I will be that organized. But since day one, for me, it's still a pretty relatively messy process. I make videos. Well, now it's at the point where I keep my audience in mind and what they want to see. So a good example is my audience really likes short form videos where they're going to learn something about their pet, whether it be their fish, their dog, their cat. So I'll have that idea in the back of my mind. And if I'm ever you know, out and about or I'm having a conversation with a friend and their pet gets brought up. Well, maybe something from that conversation will give me an idea to make a video about it. You know, I wish I could say I sit down, I have two hours of time that I block off to really write and get into the creative process, but it's a lot more spontaneous than that. And I think sometimes that's not a bad thing. I think if we get a little too, at the end of the day, we're telling stories. And it's very easy, especially the shorter the video you make, it's very easy to overthink how you're going to tell that story. So my writing process is relatively straightforward. I'll have an idea. If I have time, I'll write it or I'll think about some concepts, then I'll research it. And if I don't have time, I'll you know, put a note in my phone and worry about making it later that day or the next day. Yeah. So like, I feel like one of the things that I think it's really cool that is because of like, you have this really energetic online personality. How do you sort of like get yourself into the zone to like, you know, be energetic, put yourself out there and then having this really fun and entertaining personality like on the spot? <laughs> it's funny because there definitely is a difference maybe between me during this live stream and let's say myself back there making a video. But at the end of the day, it's still just me. It's just storytelling. And it's how I've decided how myself as Casey Rosenberg is going to tell stories on the internet. I think just it's important to stay true to yourself when you are using your voice online. But it's very important at the end of the day, you know, I sound like a broken record, but you are a storyteller. And it's going to be your job, just like it's my job to make the story as engaging as possible. And depending on who your audience is and depending on who your target demographic is, most likely your rhetoric's going to change, the way you speak is going to change, how you interact is going to change. So it's just very important to be cognizant of who your target audience is and then figure out how that audience wants to hear stories be told. For sure. Speaking of like tapping into the audience, like curious, who do you find was your audience when you started? And then do you feel like the audience was like shifting? Also, like, how do you kind of like engaging with them? Do you like comment on their comment or like, do you subscribe to their TikTok account? How do you kind of like build your own like community in the TikTok eco uh, ecosystem? It's always interesting as a content creator because you, you're always in that weird catch 22 where there's a difference between the audience who you might want to create for and the audience who your content reaches. And for me, when I started, even though it was sort of educational based videos at the beginning, I really focused on something that I was really into during my third year of law school, which mm -hmm. was mental health improvement and physical health improvement, something that I still work on to this day. But it got to the point where I can only tell people online to drink more water and get more sleep 50 times before I just turn into a caricature of myself. And, you know, frankly, that started to get boring, but it was really interesting because I started to see how, as I started to move away from that content, that content was very popular with sort of people my age, millennials. But as I started to go in quick backstory, making this content and my friend Gina suggested, well, why don't I do, since you're talking about how to do, you know, better your physical health. Why don't you talk about food? 
And we had this idea where maybe we'll find the most unhealthy food items you could buy in the United States. So I did a video on that. I did the you know, top five most unhealthy things you can buy. And that became very popular, but something that I noticed right away was my comment section went from being full of people my age to people who were younger, almost significantly younger, 10 years younger. And mm -hmm. I noticed that as I started to post more videos along those lines, sort of the audience that stuck around. And that's how I suppose I decided to realize that I am going to be uh, you know, creating content for a Gen Z based audience. Mm -hmm. And if you're creating content and you wanna figure out who your audience really is, I think it's very important to one, never assume who your audience is, because if you assume who your audience is, you might be missing out on a gold mine of opportunity. And it's very easy to find out who your audience is. Just check your comment section, scroll through their profiles, see who's following you, see who they follow. And you'll get a really good idea of not only you know, who follows you, but you'll also get an idea of what they wanna see and you can start tailoring your content towards that. Yeah, I, when you were thinking like looking at who your audience are and then looking at who they follow, it's sort of like, I thought to myself, like stalk your stalkers. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I'm just out of curiosity. So since like a lot of people are building short form content online is because of they want to build a personal brand or they want to build some sort of online reputation for themselves. And since you created this online persona, that's like a really fun character about everything online. And then you are like in real life, you're a lawyer. And how do you think that like that could like essentially translate or like related, like basically building a bridge between your real life identity to your online identity? Well, before uh, I answer that, just so I don't get in trouble with the Nevada State Bar, I take the bar exam on February 22nd. So hopefully attorney soon. But in the <laughs> meantime, I think it's, it's very beneficial. I think it's really cool. And it's a great opportunity to do both. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it was, it's really interesting because I was attending on LinkedIn yesterday. There was a short speaking series about this idea of blending who you are as an employee and who you are as a content creator. But there really shouldn't be, or at least in a perfect world, obviously we don't live in a perfect world, but I, I feel like you want to put yourself in a position where, you know, who you are in the professional world and who you are online is the same person. And I think once you get to that point in your content career and you get to that point in your professional career, you'll be able to really focus on what you truly enjoy and maybe find a better idea of what your passions are. And for me, at, at the end of the day, you know, making short form content and practicing law, both are just forms of storytelling. One just happens to be significantly more boring than the other. <laughs> Um, so I'm curious, so, you know, on TikTok, there are like a lot of the short form content are essentially in like people's daily life. So I've seen like people that are trending in, like, including people who are making ice cream and they have like 11 million following on, on TikTok, as well as like a lot of these, um, I guess like live bloggers, like people cleaning a certain space in their home um, and like, um, those are short form videos on how to's or even your video are towards, you know, like uh, what is the most popular person in America? And curious, like when it comes to like building a brand or like essentially promoting uh, certain things that are not really related to your content, how do you plan on kind of shifting gear to make something like more relevant. So what I'm saying is, for example, in our LinkedIn creator accelerator, a lot of people are job are like in, you know, in like real estate or in like esports or in energy. So like, how should we focus on like turning what's relevant to our career into short form content? I think, you know, there really shouldn't be. And I don't want to make it sound easy because nothing's ever easy. I mean, every day is a grind for myself. I'm sure it's the same for you and for anyone that's watching right now. It's always a grind. But I think when it comes to, you know, taking your career and turning it into short form content, I think the most important thing is, even though it's very cliche advice, is to not overthink it. Obviously, you're in that field because there's something about it you're passionate about. 
So when you make videos where you're passionate about that, you know, project that you're working on, it's going to shine through. And I think uh, what I see a lot of, especially recently with a lot more people in the professional world starting to make short form content is once again, I, I think there's a lot of overthinking and trying to almost oversell what they're doing. But the beauty about short form content is it's supposed to be short and it's supposed to be simple and that's okay. Like you said, when it comes to, you know, technically popular career content on the internet, well, right now there's someone who scoops ice cream with 11 million followers, you know. It, so it, it really just is about how can you make what you do engaging to someone who's not in that space? For sure. I totally see what you're saying. So um, when it comes to like coming up with ideas for things, so you mentioned that like, for example, you would like from a chat with a friend and then you turn it into an idea. Can you talk about like what exactly goes into like your action after you chat with someone? Like, do you go, like, do you instantly write them in your iPhone notes or do you like go home and like have like this giant journal or like do you use Notion? Like, how do you actually transform that into a piece of content? And in terms of like, do you on, do you like online research? And then after, like, what what kind of like equipment do you shoot on? And then how do you kind of like edit your own thing? So for me, it's like I mentioned earlier, it's it's an extremely, extremely informal process for me. And thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for the nice comments, by the way. Yeah, in the chat, I, I just saw yeah. those. For me, it's, it's still a very informal process. If I have an idea or I'm having a conversation and an idea comes to me or a friend suggests an idea, I'll text it to myself. And mm -hmm. then later when I have time to actually sit down and go, okay, I'm going to make a TikTok video. I'll pull up my text messages. I'll write it down. And I'll just, I don't use Notion. This is my very informal way of keeping, you know, scripts is I'll just start scribbling on a legal pad. And I'll start thinking about, you know, routes of how to take the idea. But the first question I always ask myself is, why would someone care? I think it's very important to reverse engineer any piece of content that you're planning on creating. And the first question you have to ask yourself is, why should someone care? And people are going to care for a variety of reasons. And usually it's rooted in some sort of emotional gain that that person's going to get. Maybe you're going to teach them something new, and that's why they should care. Some people go for shock value on the internet and people are going to care in the sense that they're going to be scared or shocked and share that with other friends. So once you ask that question, you're able to answer that question. It's much easier to then research and tailor what exactly you're going to talk about in that video that you're creating. We'll take a very simple example. A audience you know, member that's a very dedicated follower wants me to do more content on what your dog's body language means. <laughs> so that's something that I'll have to research, but you know, that's the initial idea. Well, then the next thought that I go through is, okay, if I'm going to be making a video on what your dog's body language is, you know, why would someone else care aside from maybe that one person asking for that video? And once you find that common denominator between multiple audience members and figure out how you're going to answer that question, you'll be able to start figuring out how you're going to phrase those facts that you research. So how do you figure out what is a shock factor? And also, like, as a non-pet owner, what exactly is the shock factor of someone's dog's body language? So I think for me, uh, something that I, you know, take very seriously, too, is I think when you're creating online content, there are a lot of people that are very successful, but they cross an ethical boundary. And what I mean by that is content is either staged or it is overdone on purpose to get some sort of visceral reaction out of the audience. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, just as who I am as a person, I just can't cross that line. So when it comes to getting a, a you know, whether it's a shocked reaction or just some sort of reaction out of the audience watching my video, the farthest I'll go is a smile and a share. That's what I care about at the end of the day. And I think as long as you phrase your content, and if we're using this example of you know, what your dog's body language has to say, you think of something that you've seen a lot of dogs do, but you don't know why they do it. For example, maybe why do some dogs lay down on you know, all fours and you know, tilt their head in a certain way, right? Well, if it's something that 
you know, people universally have thought about before and you answer that question, well, it, you know, it'll create some sort of satisfaction that you're answering that question. And maybe that person who has a dog or knows someone with a dog will share it to their friend and that cycle will continue. Yeah, I love that. I'm like, before I、um, research like your content, I never know that like I need to know, you know, which person's name is the most popular name among other names or like, you know, like what does your birthday mean s or like what does your like siblings mean? Intel, like to your career or something. It's like really interesting and curious when you are thinking about like ranking the content in your head on like which one to make first、uh, and actually narrow it down into like a specific question. Do you just take whatever question that was like popped in your audience comments or like do you feel like you have to go on, let's say, use keywords everywhere to research which one was the most searched? For me, it's all based on, you know, I'm proud to say that I still to this point, you know, have never looked up topics, you know, through Google or anything like that. It's all been either through comments or just figuring things out on my own. But when it comes down to, you know, let's have two or three ideas in a day that I text to myself, I decide, okay, what am I going to do? I think about and I prioritize. Most of the time it doesn't work, but I prioritize. What video is going to you know, reach the most people? Or even better, I want to phrase it as what video out of the ideas that I've written down that day are going to put the most smiles on someone's face or is going to teach the most people a lesson that day? That's so interesting. It, it is like, like you said about the niche thing. So, like, I feel like it's so like, interesting to see that. like, When everybody else were like, what is your unfair advantage? What is what exactly is the niche of your niche? And like, really double, triple down on that niche. But like, you previously mentioned that, like, you know,、uh, the niche, it, technically, your format is your niche. Can you tell us more about, like, you know, how did you discover your own format? And then, like, how did you, at what point did you feel like this format was working for you? Sure. I, I think the most important thing to keep in mind is. No matter you know, what your niche is or how you're going to format things, it's just storytelling at the end of the day. And you know, all good stories follow a very, very specific format. Granted, a lot of the times I do more listicle based content or more you know, three fun fact type content. But even with that in mind, all good stories have you know, your introduction, your rising action, your climax, your falling action, and your conclusion. And I think no matter what niche is or no matter what content you're making, as long as you keep that in the back of your mind when you're making your content, that's where you're going to find success. And for me, that's sort of the process that I take on figuring out okay, even though I don't necessarily have a niche or it's being painted in a very broad brush under the category of education, well, for me, I think to myself, okay. How am I going to take today's topic and turn it into a story in the exact same format that I've been telling previously, where it's the same style of exposition, it's the same style of rising action, et cetera? Yeah.、Um, I was wondering so, like, when you were thinking about like, your story from like, introduction to like,、um, the middle part to the climax, like, when you were thinking about this, like, how do you kind of plan out in? A really short form of content because your videos are like about a minute long or so. Like, it's like really short. And then, how do you quickly g i v i n g the audience this kind of roller coaster experience through short form storytelling? In a very humbling way. And it, this is just what I tell myself, self deprecating or not. You know, I tell myself, look, which is going to say is probably true. People don't necessarily care about what I have to say on the internet. And I think that's true for a lot of people. But with that in mind, I have to figure out okay, well, how can I get them to care at least for 30 seconds? And I think there are very proven ways to do that. So, just like any good news article, for example, you're going to have a headline. So, I'll start my video with some sort of headline, what they're going to expect over the next 30 seconds. But just like any good speech or any important lecture, You're then going to need to take a few seconds explaining who you are and why people should listen to you. Because you know, no one's going to listen, well, for the most part, to a random stranger on the internet 
if they're giving some sort of educational advice or providing a fact. So once you get your headline out of the way, you introduce who you are, you then have free reign for at least the next 20 seconds or so to keep them engaged in any way you see fit. And for me, it's sort of a, a very basic formula of fact, explanation, fact, explanation, but you're still getting the satisfaction of being introduced to that sort of rising action of what the fact is going to be. And then you get the following action of, you know, why it matters, how it wraps up. And then it just repeats two more times. Interesting. Um, so like, I think I'm curious, for example, when you are introducing a story, what if you have no relations or like, you're not an expert in a particular category. So as you mentioned, like you have to quickly introduce to people that like why they should listen to you. Um, typically, how do you kind of like quickly establish your industry expertise or like your credibility in the space? Well, you know, something that I'll never do, for example, is <laughs> I haven't been to medical school. So you're not going to see me, you know, talk about you know, prescribing medications, right? But something that I could talk about is let's say you have a, a cut on your arm. How are you going to, you know, disinfect it? How are you going to try to keep yourself healthy and, you know, have a, a successful healing process? So for me, what I'll do is, even though I might not be truly a medical expert in a particular category, there are universal truths to any career. There are universal lessons to any sort of profession that sort of the average everyday person can gain and can learn from. I think it's very important that there is a difference between you know, letting the professionals work, so to speak. So another good example is, let's speak a little closer to home with me and my legal background. There's a big difference between someone making a video who is not an attorney about how to write a legal motion mm -hmm. compared to someone who's not an attorney talking about freedom of speech in the United States. So I think as long as you respect that there is an entire field of whatever you're talking about, there is always going to be some sort of happy middle ground where you as both the creator and also an audience member and a fan of just learning something new can present content that can be a gateway to introduce the audience to a new field that they might not be familiar with before. Yeah, that's so interesting. Like to think about like, what is the universal truth about something and then kind of speak from that angle. And I think a couple of things I find really interesting about your content is like you, one one of the things that we kind of like touch upon yesterday was like, you have an iconic look and as like, you know, people react to when you take off your glasses, how do you kind of like build up this brand persona? And then do you do it intentionally? How do you kind of see why people are enjoying this type of, you know, appearance online? For me, when it comes to telling stories and how I create my videos, that was a year and a half, and it's still a process of trial and error every day. Great example is I'm starting this week creating you know, videos for LinkedIn for the first time. LinkedIn is a completely new world to me. So I know for a fact that I'm going to be failing and tinkering with making successful content for weeks on end. It's a 10 week program. I might not have a successful video at all. I might not have one until week nine for all we know, but it's all about tinkering and always trying to improve on the style of content that you create. Now, when it comes to creating an iconic look or some sort of persona you wanna be known for, these round glasses, they are now part of, let's say my online look. That was never supposed to be the case. For me, it was, I'm home in quarantine. There's a pandemic going on outside. I am too lazy to put in contacts for the day. But over time, because I started making more and more videos with the round glasses, for whatever reason, it's what the audience enjoys as part of the overall look and how I tell stories. So I'll give them that and I'll keep the glasses on when I make videos. Yeah. At the beginning, you mentioned about like the way that you got the audience insight was looking at, you know, your followers and like kind of looking at their profile that we could also tap in on LinkedIn, like seeing who, you know, follows you and then who 
essentially engage with your content. But however, I think one of the other thoughts I have is like, for example, let's say I yesterday I did a live with a、um, former chief product officer at Tinder, and let's say a lot of like product manager、um, are really enjoying the content, and then they started like following me. And then if the, today, you know, we're talking about creator related content, which is a passion of mine, and I'm like super eager to learn from you. But、um, as a product manager, I may not really like looking at content like this.、Um, how do you kind of Figure out what exactly is the thing that you kind of have the advantage to create, as well as like the sweet spot that like your audience are also gonna be able to follow along. Like, in other words, how do you figure out who exactly is your first batch of audience, and then like, do they really even share something in common? I like to think of things as a Venn diagram, and on one side you have the content that you enjoy and the content that you'd like to make. And then you have on the other side of the Venn diagram, you have the internet as a whole, the audience of the internet. And you're right; there's always going to be a sweet spot. But something that's really cool about the internet and making content is you're able to, and you're always going to be able to find a way to make what you want to talk about relevant to anybody else. Sometimes it's going to be a lot more challenging. For example, if I'm, you know. Studying quantum physics, and that's my passion. It might be difficult at first to you know, make videos on that, where you know maybe someone who wants nothing to do with physics or math, it's going to be hard to get them engaged at first. But there's always going to be a way, and I think it's more important to find how you can make what you're passionate about resonate with an audience than figuring out, you know, what can I make that would get me an audience. Mm. What would you say are like some sweet spot in your journey? So, for example, when you started creating TikTok videos, right at the beginning, maybe there were let's say 400 people were watching, and the second video, 200 people are watching. The third video, 800 people is watching. So, like, I'm curious, like, what does your journey look like? Is that like is your whole follower group coming from a couple really popular video, or would you say it was? You know, you have to put out like a gigantic amount of content, and then some stick, some don't, and then some took off like 40 days later. What was your creator journey look like? And then at what point did you feel like you were onto something? I think the best way to describe, I've been thinking about this a lot, is I feel like creating content, especially in today's creator economy, is very similar to you know being a professional baseball player in the sense that. You know, the more at bats you have, and the more chances you get to swing at it, you know, hopefully, you know, the more chances you're going to get to, you know, hit that home run.、Mm-hmm. So I know you mentioned earlier, sort of bringing up quantity versus quality of content. Now, obviously, you want large quantity of quality-based videos, right? It's just the dream, but that's impossible to do.、Mm-hmm. So I think what's important is. Depending on your schedule, you can do you know so many videos a day, but obviously the more you put out there, the greater the chances that you're going to have a successful video. But I see a lot of creators make the mistake of just thinking that they'll just throw a bunch of videos out there, and one will go viral, and then they'll have a dedicated following, which is not true. I see this all the time, and it's. Very frustrating because then I'll get emails or text messages complaining, "Why aren't I experiencing the growth that I want?"、Mm. Well, at that point, it's really you have to find a way to keep your audience engaged. So earlier, you know, in this interview, I talked about how it's important to keep a very consistent format. Well, for me, if my format is going to teach you something new, well, if I start, you know, posting videos about, you know, what I eat for breakfast.、Mm-hmm. Of course, I'm not going to get the views, or I'm not going to get that same growth. So I, I think you have to, you know, realize sort of that space you have on the internet. You can always grow, but it's very important to realize, you know, why you're making content in the first place, and then once you decide, okay, I'm going to be an educational creator, for example, it should be your job to every day think to yourself, how am I going to make this next video more engaging than the one from the day before? So it's always trying to improve on what you're doing. Yeah, for sure. So by improving, can you give us a really 
quick example of like, let's say when you first switching from making like law related, like educational mental health videos to like pivot onto right now the what is a top A B C D E、um, listicle. Vibe of videos, like at the, at the beginning when you first trying your first video, what was the mental process that you were going through, and then、uh, what do you see as like the indicator of your tapping into a giant amount of、um, attention from people? For me, it was you know I make a video, I get upset. Oh, it's not doing too well. Why aren't people engaging with this piece of content? This is the best thing I've ever created. So I sat down and I said, "Okay, well, what causes me as a viewer, as a fan of, for example, TikTok, what causes me to want to stop on a video and watch it?" So I'll sit down and I'll just start aimlessly scrolling. I won't be paying attention to what I'm seeing. I'll just aimlessly scroll, and then if something catches my eye, I'll figure out, "Okay, what about that video that caused me to stop? What about it made me want to stop?" And a very simple example is what really pivoted my content was, I used to not ask a rhetorical question or, you know, provide some sort of question where you want the answer to at the beginning of my videos. So a recent video I did that did pretty well was, you know, this is how you can stop getting brain freezes. So it's a very simple question, or it's a very, in this case, it's a very simple statement. But if you're someone just scrolling through. You know, it's not going to be probably too in depth of an answer, so you're going to want to stick around and watch it. So maybe a year and a half ago, I would have just right away went into explaining, you know, the methods on how to not get a brain freeze, why you get a brain freeze. But I change it up to, you know, I have to present them with, you know, a three second hook and a sense of why should they care or why would stopping on this video benefit them in that. I'm taking notes. I feel like you tap onto something really great, which is like, like having a hook, having something that, like, that is really gonna grab people's attention within three seconds, and then like really studying what others were doing good on that particular platform. And I'm curious, you know, like when you were doing all of these, like, were you on a cadence to posting your own content? Like, uh, because some of us are like having a lot of. Thoughts on like you know, for example, let's say、um, before I decided to create like the crypto related series was because of I constantly I'm self conscious about like you know what if I don't know much and then what if my audience know a lot more than me and then think I'm an idiot or something.、Um, so we all have these kind of self doubt. Like at that point, do you still constantly creating content to try different things and try it out, or like did you not have the cadence just pause for like you know two months and then you start over again? Trying to think of the best way to answer that question, because there there is a lot of nuance that can be taken from that. I think as long as you're honest with your audience about how much you know on a subject,、mm-hmm. as long as you don't cross that ethical boundary of how much you know on something, or if you try to present yourself in a way that you know more about an industry that you do, I think that's when you can get into trouble. That's when people are going to turn on you, and that's when you're going to have a problem with creating content in the future. But I think something that I take pride in, and any successful creator,、um, you know, with a maybe a, a better moral compass than some other creators, would be to acknowledge, you know, whatever they're going to be talking about is what they know, and that's exactly what they know, and they're proud of what they know. And if they're wrong about something, well, you know, they're going to be wrong, but They had the best intentions. It was well well researched, and they're excited to learn and move on. Of course, I try to put myself in a position where I'm not going to, you know, try to teach or explain a fact about something I don't know. But I think it's very important to, as long as you are not crossing any lines and you're just being honest about sharing something fun and something that you enjoy with the world, you're going to be okay. No one's no one. Cares about another person enough on the internet to judge them that harshly. I love that. Like, I feel like, yeah. So, one thing that I'm curious is, like, when you were experimenting this new, like, form of content format、um, previously, how do you, like, do you post three times a day? Do you post five times a day? What was the frequency that you were using to, you know, grow the grow your 
audience to today's size? I would post pretty frequently. I, I think in my sort of heyday of in my final year of you know law school, because everything moved online, it's probably posting maybe two to three times per day. But that's not like a hard fast rule. Something that drives me crazy is I see so many people talking about, oh, you have to post either at X time or you have to post Y amount in a day. Like that's all that's all baloney. It's as long as you're making content that people want to watch, you can post once a month, once a day, once a, it doesn't matter. As long as the content's good, it doesn't matter how much of it you post. But I think obviously posting more helped me, but I had to be very cognizant about any time that I post something new, it has to try to be more engaging and it has to try to be better than the previous video. When, of course, that's not going to happen. That's only going to happen maybe one out of a hundred times, but that's still something you want to try to aim for for every time you post. Yeah, I feel like I really enjoy the mindset of like each one is supposed to be better than the last one instead of just, you know, making it for the sake of making it. Do you, you mentioned like um, at your peak, you would make two to three videos per day. Uh, and like, do you make them like in the, like one in the morning, one in the evening, or like how do you kind of like, get it started and then how long does it take you to like actually editing all these videos because I feel like editing for me it was just taking forever mm -hmm. it's like muscle memory in the sense that I'm going to answer these out of order I'm going to answer the second question first I think when it comes to you know the speed of editing and the speed of the creative process itself I think it's very akin to muscle memory in the sense that the more you do it the faster you'll get at it and for example, I used to film and edit all of my content because I'm still just for the most part, a TikTok creator. I'm finally at that point in 2022 where I'm going to be cross-platforming, starting for example, this year with Snapchat, LinkedIn, and YouTube, probably also Instagram, but you know that will come in time over the next few months. So I used to edit everything exclusively in the TikTok app. I got extremely fast at that. I'd be able to, once I had a script down, I'd probably be able to you know, write and edit and publish it within 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. But now I've realized, okay, if I'm going to take that next step in my content creation career, I need to be editing and filming outside of just one social media app. So mm -hmm. now what I do is I film still on my phone, but then I'll edit it on Final Cut Pro on my Mac. And that is taking me so much longer but I know in time, I'll get fast at it. It's just, you have to grind through it and just, it's like a sport, right? Just the more you practice, the faster and the better you'll get at it. And I know your first question was frequency of posting. Do I do it in the morning? Do I worry about it at night? And I have noticed, especially over the last few months, every time that I try and this is just my personality. This is just who I am as a person. I have to accept it. I am realizing that <laughs> the more I try to set a schedule for myself, the worse it's going to be. I'm going to be stressed out. I'm going to you know, be producing something in a rush if I decide, okay, I'm going to make this video from 8 a.m. It's going to be uploaded by 10 a.m. I have two hours. Let's go. <laughs> for me, that's a recipe for disaster. So on days where I post, you know, more frequently, two to three times a day, or even maybe one time a day or once every two days, I am still to this day posting whenever I have time. Fortunate to be in a position where because I do content full time, I have a lot more time to do it. But even when I was at my busiest you know, doing, you know, 10, 12 hour law school days, you know, there's still going to be those random gaps where if you really enjoy it, you can, you know, crank something out. If you have a system in place, you have an idea of how you're going to tell your story, then it's just plugging and playing what you're going to tell. What is your mentality when it comes to creating content? So for example, I was the other day, I was listening to like Colin Samir interviewing Victoria Paris, who is also like a big TikTok creator. Essentially, she was saying like, she would like treat it as like a job or something. So essentially she would like be really like focusing on like just vlogging herself all the time in New York. And then like a lot of people treat it as like a really competitive sports. Like when you were thinking about this, do you feel like this is 
a part of your hobby, but now actually it turned into like a full time job for you? Or how do you kind of like navigate the, I guess, like the mentality of like a popular creator? I think the more that I treat it at, because, you know, technically it is a job, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. what I do full time. Mm -hmm. With that being said, I think the more that I treat the creative process as a job mm -hmm. instead of almost a fun game of trying to get engagement, I think that's where the trouble starts. Mm -hmm. I think at least for me, everyone's different the way I think to be successful online and just for me is treat the content creation like a game. It's still a game of engagement and interaction and making someone's day a little bit better. Where it comes to more as a career is it's the intellectual property rights. It's the contract negotiations. It's mm -hmm. the sponsorships. It's the collaborations. That stuff to me is sort of that career stuff where I wake up in the morning and go, okay, I'm going to, you know, work through these three contracts from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. That's more so where the, the job feel comes in, which helps me stay balanced and allows me to do this full time. Absolutely. You mentioned a great point about like, you know, monetization, like signing contract or like working with companies. As a creator, how do you kind of schedule your day? Is that like in the morning, five hours, I'm only going to do a contract. I'm going only going to do, you know, sponsorship negotiations and then in the in the afternoon, I'm gonna be making content. And you mentioned about like freestyle on the content aspect. Um, for the business aspect, what is your schedule like essentially? Right now, I pretty much have two sort of anchors to my day. Mm -hmm. It would be waking up usually about <laughs> six thirty. I'll wake up. You know, it takes me a while to wake up. I'll go for a walk in the morning, and then whatever happens that day, if I have errands or if I have a meeting or I have an appointment, obviously you know, I'll have to schedule around those obligations. But for me, in a perfect world, it's I'm going to ask myself, okay, if I have no other obligations for the day, it's just a pure day of content creation. You know, for me, that's not the case now because I'm studying for the bar exam. But in a perfect world, it would be waking up and saying, okay, I have from between, let's say, 8.30 to 4.30, which is when I'll get on the Peloton bike. I need to do something. What that something is, I don't necessarily plan out. I don't, the more pressure I put on myself to perform a specific task, the harder it is for me to actually accomplish it, the more overwhelmed I'll get. I think for me, I benefit from a more, you know, seeing the forest from the trees perspective, having that, you know, bird's eye approach is saying, look, I know, for example, I have to answer all of my emails today. I know, for example, I need to make a video for the day. That just has to be done before I go to sleep. I got to fill in the gaps from there. Interesting. I like that approach. I feel like it gives you a lot less pressure to like, instead of like, you know, you're um, creating a gigantic agenda and then like not accomplishing something. And curious, um, you know, now you're on like many different platforms, like for as content creators, um, a lot of it was like repurposing the content and curious, like, do you have a strategy for each platform that you personally like planning on, like spending the time grow on? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's true. Every platform is different. And, you know, I'm at the point where primarily just a TikTok creator this year will be the year of cross platforming and expanding, but you have to be a student of the game. So something that I need to do before I start posting Instagram reels, for example, or before I start really getting into the nitty gritty of LinkedIn content mm -hmm. is I need to take, you know, hours out of my day, something where I do realize this is what I have to accomplish in my day. I need to study what is popular, what other creators do and how I can, you know, stand out from what other creators are doing. It's going to be the same process on every social media app. Now in a perfect world, I'd be able to create one piece of content akin to maybe like a TikTok video I make. And as long as I can create some sort of sweet spot where that would do well on all those platforms, that would be the perfect, you know, combination, but that's going to be difficult. It's after a year and a half, I'm still trying to figure out how to make a TikTok video. So I know it'll take me uh, a bit of time to figure out how I can make a viral LinkedIn post, but you just have to try, you have to figure it out and, 
every day, just work on it. So like a lot of brands are trying to create short form contents for themselves. We've seen these, um, yeah, like there's a couple of ways to call, like do like the brand related short content, right? Some brands um, create their own short videos and then some brands are like letting their employees creating their short videos. Curious um, if anyone who is in the listener who are running their own company, how should they create short engaging videos for the audience as well as like, you know, uh, making their own brand image and concept stand out? I think the most important thing whether you are a brand working for a brand social media account, you yourself as the brand is you have to stay true to yourself. And Mm -hmm. I think the biggest problem that still to this day, nine out of 10 brands get wrong on social media is they try to be a brand. They try to be this perfect, you know, everything is just perfection in what we do. This is what we post type brand. But when you look at, you know, who's actually doing well branding wise on the internet, things that come to mind are the Wendy's Twitter account, the Duolingo TikTok account. And these are brands that are professional brands, but they've realized that people are tired of this fake, you know, commercialized, you know, brand messaging. Now, there's also people that have turned on these accounts as well, because now brands are obviously trying to go down this route. And sometimes it's a little too forced. But I I think what's the most important thing is just be yourself. Even if you are a company, it's important to whoever is posting that content for the company, let people know that it's an actual human being making these posts. It's their job. They're trying to get engagement. Just be honest with the audience of who you are and what you're trying to get out of it. I've seen like, um, essentially there are, um, like there are brands on different social media platforms, like trying to stand out by just having one or two employee um, just talk about their brands all the time. And then there, there's also like brand interacting as a brand using the brand account. Like there was an employee on uh, Twitter who was like very vocal about the brand. And then essentially the brand built a great social image through that way. And then there were also brands that are like just performing as a brand. Do you think the human aspect is better? Or do you feel like the brand should stay with as a brand tweeting from the brand account? Because I feel like as a brand, it's really hard to have a consistent image uh, because of assuming the people behind it are is a team, people who have like different opinion on things. It's a very good point is it's definitely hard to keep a consistent message if there's multiple people running the social media platforms. Going to give the answer that no one wants to hear, but I'm going to say it depends. It just depends on what type of, if if you're going to try to get engagement through humor, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's funnier for the brand themselves to do something outlandish than just the random millennial running the account, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's more entertaining and it's more engaging to get some sort of lifestyle vlog from the person who's an employee of the company. So Mm -hmm. I I think at the end of the day, it's just the brand has to figure out what's going to get engagements. And there are so many routes to take, but I think it's very important to just like a content creator themselves who is not a brand yet, you know, take it one day at a time, play around, tell a story. And if that story you're telling is not working, try another strategy. The worst thing that you can do is keep on trying the same thing over and over again, and you don't get any success. Love it. So like basically focusing on trying, constantly experiencing new things. So what does your content diet look like? Do you, is there any specific channels that you follow or like specific accounts that you feel like that inspired how, you know, how you present yourself on the internet? I've always been a fan of, (laughs) so (laughs) it's funny because I've been in law school studying for the bar exam. Now, I don't really have time to, you know, watch content and consume content myself. And the content that I do watch in my spare time really has nothing to do with sort of what I do and what content I create. And what I mean by that is if I'm going to be consuming content, you know, passively, I'm going to be on Twitch watching someone 
you know, play you know, Super Mario 64 and try to speed run that game. I'm going to, you know, listen to some sort of podcast about how to optimize my brain performance. So granted, I guess that second result, like uh, the examples I was thinking about, I was listening to the Uberman Lab podcast earlier today. Granted, that's also educational, but it's a completely different style than you know, what I create. So at least for me, I don't necessarily have someone that I look up to in my space. But I think at the end of the day, when you're a student of the game, so to speak, no matter what content you consume, you're going to be able to find some sort of lesson for whatever content that you produce. Let's say if you are summarizing on content creation into a couple different skills and uh, you want to get resources to like improve those skills, like what would it be? Would it be, let's say, marketing, like marketer writing or like sales or, uh, you know, movie writing? Like what exactly goes into creating a viral content? And then what I, I guess what goes into meaning like, you know, what are the basic skill underneath the creation and how what was your process on like you know improving your skills in these couple categories? I would say the two most important categories, at least for me, and two you know skills that I need to work on every single day is first having a really solid grasp of rhetoric, and that was my background when I was an undergrad. Getting my degree was in communication studies, and I was a student of rhetoric, and I was really big in sophistry, for example. And I think having an idea of learning what makes people tick, so to speak, is very, very important. Because at the end of the day, storytelling and rhetoric go hand in hand with each other. I think the second skill that's very important, if there's some sort of you know, industry to study, I know you mentioned marketing. For me, I think the most important thing, and I think this applies to a food content creator. I think this applies to a car content creator. It doesn't matter who the content creator is is to study journalism. I think there is so much that can be gained from learning how someone can take, a especially in 2022, when we're in an age where we're moving away rapidly from print-based media, I think studying how someone is still able to take a text-based post and make that go viral, there are a lot of lessons to be learned from those strategies that you can apply to a, you know, a video-based piece of content. So I think at the end of the day, the two areas that I would say if you're looking to learn more about creating successful content would be studying speech communication, specifically rhetoric, and studying journalism. Oh my God, I, I, you sounds like my elementary school teacher. They really focus on, you know, like my writing skill back then. But anyway, so um, we're at the last part of the interview. So I have a mini fire round for you. So number one, what's your favorite book? My favorite book, I'll give you a, uh, a highbrow answer and a lowbrow answer. So highbrow answer is a book by a former Navy SEAL named Jocko Willink. It's called Extreme Ownership. Mm. I think there are a lot of valuable lessons from that book. Talks about how pretty much if you live for internal validation instead of external validation, you're going to find fulfillment. So that's really good just from mental health, physical health, et cetera, right? So that's my highbrow answer. My lowbrow answer, my favorite book of all time is by Ernest Klein, Ready Player One. I love it. I, I think I've seen the movie. Was there a movie? I think there was a movie. There was a movie. And this is where I'm that person that's going to complain. The movie is not like the book. But I love that book. And I would say my second favorite book, I'm really big into, maybe this has something to do with why I like making you know, social media content, but I'm really big into that sort of sci-fi dystopian metaverse future. So my second favorite book, which I would recommend, especially for people to read now, because it's where you know, metaverse was coined is Snow Crash. That's a great book also. We'll totally give it a read. Um, it sounds really interesting. I'm really like trending right now. So where, like, who would you invite to your dinner party? I would invite, now, do they have to be alive or could they be anybody? Anything, it's your party. Okay, I would try to get a few philosophers there and just try to figure out, this is the nerdy answer, you know, figuring out what exactly is truth and how we can figure out. I think there are so many questions that you can learn about fulfillment, 
So, okay, I'm going to bring Protagoras. I'm going to bring Socrates. You know, I'm going to bring maybe uh, Carl Jung. I'm going to bring, I think if I can get a few of those people at a dinner party, that would make for a great dinner conversation. Love that. So who made the biggest impact in your career? I would say, cliche answer, maybe I'd say my family, my parents, because making TikTok videos as a third year law student, it's not necessarily the most traditional thing to do. I mean, I'm supposed to be a boring, you know, book reading law student, right? But they have been very supportive and that has meant a lot to me. And it's just been nice having people in your corner that are supportive of you, you know, taking an unconventional route to how you want to run your career. Last question, where can we find you outside of work? Who oh, outside of work, pre-pandemic, it would be a bowling alley. I think post-pandemic, where do I go? It's fine. I'm thinking like, where do I go? I just sit here. I just sit here and make content all day now. But <laughs> I think uh, if it's not the bowling alley, I'll say I would be at a tiki lounge with my friend Matt talking about the football games over the past week. That's the most specific answer I've got. Um, <laughs> well, Casey, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. This is wonderful.